Every year, over 40 million tons of asphalt are laid worldwide, and almost a quarter of it is made from old pavement. Imagine, the road you're driving on right now might contain pieces of a highway that trucks were speeding on just yesterday. This isn't just about saving billions of dollars. It's one of the most large-scale examples of the circular economy in the world. Explosions in quarries, giant crushers, hundreds of degrees of heat in the drums of factories, and complex recipes more precise than culinary ones. And all of this to create a black, hot mass that transforms into a smooth road. But the real secret of asphalt is hidden deeper, and you'll find it out if you watch until the end. Almost nothing goes to waste. This crushed old asphalt is then added to the new mixture at the plant. On average, the new asphalt laid on roads contains about 22% recycled material. This has a colossal economic and environmental effect. First, it significantly reduces the need to mine new stone and produce new bitumen, which saves natural resources and energy. Second, it makes the final product cheaper, which allows for saving billions of dollars from road maintenance budgets. Thus, every car trip is a journey on a complex engineering product that not only withstands huge loads, but is also a vivid example of an industrial ecosystem where the old is constantly reborn into the new, closing the loop and making the country's infrastructure a little more sustainable. The story of asphalt begins not on the road, but in two completely different places. The first place is a quarry. It's a huge wound on the body of the earth where stone is mined. It all starts with a loud explosion that shakes the ground for miles around. Huge boulders break off from the rock face. Then, giant dump trucks, with wheels taller than a person, come into play and haul these stone boulders to the primary crusher. This is a metal monster that, with its steel jaws and incredible force, crushes huge boulders into smaller pieces. But this is just the beginning. Then this stone goes through a whole series of crushes and screens giant vibrating sieves. The purpose of this process is not just to crush the stone, but to carefully sort it by size. The result is entire mountains of clean, sorted stone, which is called aggregate. There's everything here, from large stones the size of a fist to fine crumb, and even dust similar to sand. Each fraction is stored in a separate pile. It's similar to how in your kitchen you have flour, sugar, salt, each ingredient separate, waiting for its time. This is the skeleton of the future asphalt, which makes up 95% of its mass. The second place where asphalt is born is an oil refinery. When gasoline, diesel, jet fuel, and other light products are made from crude oil, a thick black viscous substance remains at the very bottom of the distillation column. This is bitumen. In its normal state, at room temperature, it's as hard as a rock, you can break it with a hammer. But if you heat it, it becomes liquid, like a thick syrup. It is this property of being solid when cold and liquid when hot that makes it the perfect glue for our stone skeleton. Bitumen is the soul of asphalt. It's black heart that binds everything together. And now, let's move to the asphalt concrete plant. This is the place where all the ingredients meet. From a distance, it looks like a complex, tangled metal construction set. Tall tower silos, endless conveyor belts, pipes, tanks, and a central tower from which smoke rises. It's a real factory that works as one cohesive organism. Different fractions of aggregate from separate bins are fed onto a conveyor belt. But not just like that. The whole process is controlled by a computer. An operator in a cabin enters the precise asphalt recipe. Depending on where the asphalt will be used, for a busy highway or a quiet side street, the recipe will be different. The computer knows what percentage of large stone, how much medium, how much small, and how much dust is needed for the perfect mix. It's like baking a complex cake where every gram matters. This mixture of stones begins its journey up a long, inclined conveyor and enters the heart of the plant, the drying drum. This is a huge, long tube that slowly rotates, installed at a slight incline. 
From one of its ends, a powerful burner blasts a roaring pillar of fire inside, like in a jet engine. The temperature inside reaches 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The stone, slowly tumbling inside this drum, heats up and most importantly, is completely dried. Moisture is the main enemy of good asphalt. Even a drop of water can prevent the bitumen from adhering reliably to the surface of the stone. Therefore, the stone must be absolutely dry. After the drying drum, the hot moisture freestone is lifted by an elevator, similar to a lift for bulk materials, to the very top of the central tower. There it passes through a system of screens for a final control sorting and enters bins for hot materials. In parallel with this, in special insulated tanks, our black glue bitumen is heated. It is also brought to a high temperature to become fluid and liquid. And now comes the climax. The computer gives another command. A weigh hopper with incredible accuracy measures out the required amount of hot stone of each fraction from different bins. Then, a precisely measured amount of hot liquid bitumen is injected into this red hot stone mixture. This entire mass stone and bitumen enters a mixing chamber called a pug mill. It's like a giant kitchen mixer, only instead of whisks, it has two powerful shafts with metal paddles. These paddles mix the red hot mass with enormous force, and in less than a minute, every little stone, every grain of sand is covered with a thin, shiny film of black bitumen. The finished asphalt emerges from the chamber, a uniform, steaming black mass with a characteristic oily smell. Now this hot, freshly prepared product needs to be stored until shipment. It is lifted and poured into special insulated storage silos. They are like giant thermoses that can keep the asphalt hot for many hours, and sometimes even days. Dump trucks drive up under these silos. With a loud clang, a gate opens, and several tons of hot asphalt pour into the truck's bed with a roar and a cloud of steam. The bed is necessarily covered with a tarp to preserve the precious heat during transport to the paving site. At the construction site, the final act of this play begins. The dump truck slowly unloads the hot mixture into the hopper of a special machine and asphalt paver. This machine, slowly moving forward, evenly distributes the asphalt over the road surface, forming a perfectly level layer of a given thickness. At the back of the paver is a heavy, heated plate called a screed. It does the initial compaction and gives the surface its initial smoothness, but the asphalt is still soft and loose. To make it strong, it needs to be compacted. Immediately behind the paver follows a whole team of heavy road rollers. First come the large steel drum rollers, which with their enormous pressure, squeeze the air out of the asphalt mixture and force the stones to fit more tightly together. Then, pneumatic tire rollers may be used, which knead the surface, making it even denser. And in the final stage, smooth steel drum rollers pass over it again to give the road its final smoothness. As the asphalt cools, the bitumen turns from a liquid state back into a solid. It permanently glues all the little stones together, turning the loose mixture into a strong, waterproof monolith. After a few hours, the road, which was recently hot and soft, becomes hard and ready for traffic. And that's the whole point. From the explosion in the quarry to the heavy roller on the road, every stage of this process is aimed at creating a durable, reliable surface that will withstand thousands of cars every day. Every year, billions of square feet of drywall are produced worldwide. In the United States alone, over 27 billion. That's enough to lay a three-foot wide path from the Earth to the Moon, and still have enough for halfway back. Imagine millions of tons of stone being transformed into the smooth walls of our homes. But the real secret begins where ordinary grey stone becomes a thirsty powder, a material that can miraculously turn back into stone. Watch closely. At the end, you will discover a secret that most people have never even guessed. The numbers behind drywall production in the United States are not just big, they are astronomical, and they tell a story of how the country builds, renovates, and breathes. In a recent year, factories in the US produced approximately 27 billion square feet of drywall panels. 
This number is so colossal that it's hard to comprehend. Try to imagine. If you were to lay out all this amount of drywall, you could create a continuous three-foot wide path that would stretch from the Earth to the Moon and almost halfway back. Or, with this number of sheets, you could completely cover the entire territory of the state of Delaware twice and still have some left over. This endless stream of building material is not only a physical product, but also a powerful economic indicator. The market for these panels in the US is valued in the tens of billions of dollars, reflecting not just the cost of the material itself, but also thousands of jobs in mines and factories, in logistics and construction. It all begins not in a workshop, but much earlier, in a quarry where gypsum is mined. This is a natural mineral, a stone that formed millions of years ago from ancient seas. It can be white, grayish, sometimes with pink veins. Huge excavators dig into the gypsum deposits and load dump trucks with boulders of this stone. These trucks bring tons of gypsum to the factory and dump it onto the raw material yard, creating entire mountains waiting for their transformation. The first stage inside the factory is coarse crushing. The gypsum boulders fall into the giant steel jaws of a primary crusher. With a deafening roar and grinding, the machine breaks the large stones into smaller pieces, the size of a fist. This is just the beginning. Then this crushed gypsum is fed by a conveyor belt to secondary mills. Here, dozens of steel hammers, rotating at an insane speed, break these pieces into even smaller fractions, turning them into something like coarse gravel. But even this is not enough. The final stage of grinding turns the gypsum into a fine, powder-like dust. It becomes so fine that it resembles flour or dust. This powder is the main raw material, but it still hides a secret that needs to be revealed. The next step is one of the most important and interesting. It's a process called calcination, and in essence, it's the controlled drying of gypsum. The thing is, in the crystalline structure of natural gypsum, water molecules are locked in. For drywall to be able to harden, this water must be temporarily driven out. To do this, the white powder is fed into a huge, slowly rotating kiln. It looks like a giant drum, tilted at a slight angle. Inside this kiln, a very precise temperature is maintained, around 300 degrees Fahrenheit. The gypsum powder, slowly tumbling inside the drum, heats up, and the water bound to it turns into steam and evaporates. Chemically speaking, Gypsum turns into calcium sulfate hemihydrate, but to put it simply, it becomes thirsty. Now this powder, which is now called plaster of Paris, or stucco, has a unique property. If you add water to it again, it will greedily absorb it and turn back into a hard gypsum stone. It is this property that lies at the heart of the entire production process. The resulting hot powder is cooled and stored in giant silos, resembling towers, from where it will be fed to the main production line. And now, the most spectacular part begins. The creation of the sheet itself. In the workshop, there is a huge conveyor, hundreds of feet long. At its beginning stand two giant rolls of special dense paper, or paperboard. One roll is for the face side, it is perfectly smooth and white. The other is for the backside. It can be a bit darker and grayish. The ribbon from the bottom roll, the face side, is unwound and laid on the conveyor, forming an endless track. In parallel with this, in a giant mixer resembling an industrial food processor, the core is prepared. Our thirsty gypsum powder, water, and a whole cocktail of various additives are continuously fed into it. Each additive plays its own role. Foaming agents make the gypsum mass lighter and more porous, like whipped cream, to reduce the weight of the sheet. Plasticizers make the mixture more fluid, so it spreads evenly. Accelerators or retarders allow engineers to perfectly control the time it takes for the gypsum to set. Starch helps the gypsum core to better adhere to the paper covering, and fiberglass adds strength. This mixture, called a slurry, resembles a thick gray porridge. It is poured in a continuous stream directly onto the paper ribbon, moving on the conveyor. Special devices evenly distribute this mass across the entire width of the paper. The edges of the bottom sheet of paper 
are neatly folded upwards, forming the sides of the future sheet. And at this moment, the second ribbon of paper from the back roll is laid on top, like a lid. The result is an endless, perfectly even sandwich. Paper, gypsum mass, paper. This sandwich immediately passes between two rollers or under a forming plate, which compress it to a precisely specified thickness. For example, half an inch. The newly formed, still soft and wet sheet of drywall continues its journey on a very long conveyor, which is called the setting line. Its length can reach several hundred feet. As the sheet slowly moves, a real miracle happens inside it. The gypsum powder reacts with water. The rehydration reaction takes place. The gypsum turns back into a hard stone, releasing heat in the process. If you touch the sheet at this stage, it will be warm. In a few minutes, the loose mass becomes hard enough to hold its shape. At the end of this long line stands a flying knife. This is a huge blade that moves in sync with the belt and at the right moment makes a quick, precise cut, slicing the endless sandwich into sheets of standard length. For example, 8 or 12 feet. This happens so quickly that the conveyor doesn't stop for a second. The cut sheets are now hard, but still very wet. They contain excess water that did not take part in the chemical reaction. It needs to be removed. Therefore, a special device flips the sheets and feeds them into the most large-scale structure in the factory, a multi-level drying kiln. This is a giant labyrinth consisting of several levels, each of which is a conveyor. The drywall sheets slowly move along these levels back and forth, traveling a path of several hundred feet inside this huge furnace. Hot air circulating inside gently evaporates the excess moisture from them. The temperature here is controlled very carefully, only the free water needs to be removed, without damaging the crystal structure of the gypsum itself. This process can take about an hour. At the exit of the dryer, the product we are familiar with appears, a perfectly dry, light and strong sheet of drywall. But this is not the end. The final stage is finishing. Two finished sheets are stacked face to face. Their edges are perfectly trimmed to be even and clean. A paper tape with information about the manufacturer and product type is glued to the ends. After this, robotic manipulators with superhuman precision and grace lift the finished sheets and stack them in perfectly even piles on pallets. Each stack is wrapped in protective film, labeled and sent to the warehouse. From there, it will travel to construction sites to become part of someone's home having transformed from a simple greystone mined from the earth into a smooth and cozy wall. Drywall production is like a barometer of the construction industry's health. When the economy is on the rise, people actively build new houses and renovate old ones, and the demand for drywall skyrockets. The factories that produce this product operate at full capacity, and the flow of trucks delivering the finished sheets across the country becomes endless. The heart of this production beats in unison with the rhythm of the real estate market. Geographically, this industry also has its centers. Although drywall manufacturing plants are located throughout the country to be closer to large construction markets, the mining of the main raw material, gypsum, is concentrated in certain states. The leaders here are states like Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nevada, and Iowa.